Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our September Feature of the Month webinar. Uh, my name is Sirsha, and I'll be kicking off today's ses session um, with some general housekeeping information before handing you over to today's presenter, Rich. So just to begin, I'd like to let you all know that on joining this webinar, you've automatically been put on mute. We have allocated time for your questions at the end of the session, so please feel free to use the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel to ask these. For any follow-up questions, you can reach out to us by email at marketing at or you can get in touch with your designated support contact. Finally, I'd like to point out that this session is being recorded and it will be emailed to all the registrants afterwards. Now I'd like to hand you over to Rich Shoup, one of our LearnOsti's business development engineers, and he's based in our New York office. I'm sure many of you have had the pleasure of talking to him before. So thanks again for joining, and we hope you find this session beneficial. So it's over to you now, Rich. Thank you, Susha. <clears throat> Please interrupt uh, any time if you have any uh, you know, things you have to say, if any display issues or anything like that. For Welcome, sure. everyone. Uh, this is the Feature of the Month webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about customizing the question editor, uh, and we're going to look at a variety of ways to customize it. We're really just going to be touching the tip of the iceberg, so we want to invite you to uh, you know, get in contact with us if you have specific needs or any problems or anything that you may experience. A couple of things that you uh, want to know as you start, some of the things that uh, Sush has already mentioned. Uh, you're automatically on mute. You'll be able to text questions. Uh, Tisha may interrupt at some point if she feels like she wants to bring a question up during the, the seminar. Uh, we've allocated time at the end, uh, which will be an easier way to handle that, uh, so we can review everything that's been sent in via text at that time as well. Um, again, if you have any questions that haven't been answered, if we run out of time, feel free to email us. Uh, and ultimately, at the end, we'll be disseminating a link for the recording. And at the end of the uh, slide deck, I have a URL of some sample code that you can download to go over some of the things that we talk about. We will be looking at code, but I'm not going to stress it very heavily. I'm just going to show you some of the bits and pieces that we're going to be adding. I've broken up the uh, source code in pieces so you can see just the recent, most relevant materials. And hopefully, that will be uh, all you'll need to, to use. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Rich Shoup, as Sirsha mentioned. I'm a business development engineer in the New York office of Learnocity. Uh, you can reach out to us uh, by email or through tickets as you normally might. So as I said, today we're going to be looking at the question editor. We're going to look at a couple of out-of-the-box solutions, both uh, standalone and predominantly in this seminar through the use or embedded in the author API. That's true not only of the hosted author portal, if you use our author site, but also the embedded solution of the author API if you're using that in your own pages, in your own single sign-on environment. We're going to take a quick look at some basic implementations of changes to the authoring environment, including simple authoring mode, which is something that Lunosity has introduced, an opinionated version of a simple interface. But then we're going to go from there on to how you can customize that experience making it even simpler or more power user oriented if you wish. We're going to take a look at creating custom question templates and organizing the question editor tile view into your own groups. We're going to take a look at how you can add custom metadata to the UI so that you can add metadata to the question data and as a result you can uh, parse that out at runtime or, or use it for additional purposes like hints and distract the rationale and things of that nature. We're also going to be looking at creating or customizing editors on a per question basis. So you can, for example, customize all multiple choice questions if you wish. And we're going to take a quick look at more advanced uses of customizing the interface through layouts. Uh, this is where you will uh, create a custom uh, XML format to host the widgets or the elements, UI elements of the authoring environment, and you can customize them quite heavily. We'll show you, for example, how to put the editor into an accordion. Uh, you can take a look at a global demo very briefly if we have time that'll show how you can put the editor pieces in different things like modals and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and get started. Initially, we're talking about how the question editor looks out of the box. And you'll see how simple it is to invoke. Uh, if you're using the question editor standalone, 
uh, which is something that you would do only if you were saving all the question JSON yourself in your own database. That's a rarity. Uh, you'll see that it's just a couple of lines of code. If you're using it inside the author API, uh, that's also very simple to do. Uh, the author API does persist back to the Linosity item bank, so there's a little bit of additional authentication there. Uh, we'll be using the PHP environment uh, to show you these demos, but all of the customization that we're going to be talking about is done straight through JSON, so it'll be really easy to understand. Um, so we'll take a look first at the uh, question editor in a standalone environment. What I'm going to do is toggle back and forth between our slides and uh, local code examples just to show you how simple it is. And for later use, you'll be able to see that we also have some hosted demos that you can take a look at uh, when you get to reviewing the material in, in the presentation. So let's take a look at uh, a standalone editor. So as you see here, you see nothing but the question editor. Obviously, it will conform to whatever parent elements you want to include in your design. So in this case, it's full screen, but you could also put it into a smaller view or in a modal or something along those lines. And when you look at a basic uh, default implementation of the question editor, you will see the default question templates that Lernosity has created uh, on the right what, three-fifths, four-fifths of this screen, you'll see all the tiles for each of the templates that are uh, provided out of the box. And then over here in the left column, you'll see all the groups into which these questions are organized. So in this particular case, we have multiple choice selected, and you'll see a variety of templates for multiple choice. Uh, some of the things we'll look at later you'll be familiar with, so just quickly point out, you have standard radio button uses, you have block format uses, and then more advanced uses such as choice matrix. And then if you change headings over here in the groups or the categories, you'll see a new set of templates that belong in that particular category. So let's take a look at the code required to make this happen. You'll see it's very, very simple. I'm not going to be reading this to you, uh, but I've commented for you so that you can download this code later and pick up where the presentation left off. But as you see here, all we need to init the question editor in standalone is a simple init call. Uh, we do have the consumer key there for you, but that's the extent of the authentication you need. So once we preview this, uh, you'll see that that is what you get here. You get the question editor in whatever HTML uh, parent or form that you've, DOM structure that you've created. And you can go about editing each of these questions. I'm going to take a quick look at this because we're going to be customizing this view, so I want you to use this sort of as a barometer, if you will. You've probably seen this yourself already, having used the question editor before. But essentially, you have a choice of seeing a full edit view, or later we'll look at a split pane edit preview option. You've got things like your stimulus, your distractors, the correct answer, uh, question-specific additional options, either at the top level or in a more options pane that apply to that specific question. And then you have uh, additional content down at the bottom, and We'll also look later at adding a section for, for custom metadata. So this will give you some sense of what a default question looks like, question editor looks like for, in this case, multiple choice. And if you go back again, here's the tile view. We'll be looking at that a little later on, later on as well. Now, if we look here at our list of demos that we're going to be uh, including, we have, uh, in addition to the default editor, we're going to look at some basic customization, and then we're also going to look at customizing that inside the author API. So let's take a look at the uh, basic UI customization, and let's first look at the code for this file. We're going to do a real simple thing just to show you that it's possible to make simple changes through JSON. This is still in standalone view, and then I'm going to apply the same customization to the author API, and then from there on out, we'll be looking at everything in that environment. So as you can see here, I've added one property called UI. And in this particular case, I'm switching our global layout to a split pane edit preview option. And I've also removed the ability to change the question type. Uh, you may have seen me use that button in the upper left-hand corner. I'll show you again in just a moment. And I've also hidden the source button. This is just a start off to show you how easy it is to customize the environment to either add features or hide features. In this particular case, a good example being hiding the source button if you don't want your authors 
editing the JSON directly for a particular question type, uh, or if you don't want them to be able to switch between questions if you want to restrict their access to a particular question type. So let's switch back over to Chrome and get a good look at what it looks like uh, one more time to see the default. When you see the multiple choice, you'll see this change question button here. And then you'll also see the source button here. So as you can see, I can look at the source for a particular question and I can switch from multiple choice, let's say, to fill in the blank. So let's see how we can restrict users from doing that. When we hide those buttons, the new view, this is the same view we saw before with the templates. So once we launch, in, launch into a question, you'll see that there's no change question type button any longer. And then over here to the right, you'll see that the source button has also been hidden. So again, this is just a real simple uh, introduction to JSON control over some of your more basic elements. Uh, and then ultimately, by the end of the, of the seminar, we'll give you an idea of how you can customize things to a really deep degree uh, by using custom layouts. So now let's migrate from our standalone question editor to how we might make these same types of changes in the author API. So let's take a look at the default author API implementation. Here again, you're persisting back to the Lernosity item bank. You are item bank in the cloud. You are interacting with Lernosity servers, so there's now a degree of authentication that needs to be added. So in this config file, you have your consumer key and secret. In the source files that you'll be able to download, they're just the demo key and secret, but you can obviously change those to your own. We then have the SDK available to sign this result, sign this request for us when we submit it to Lenocity servers. And then down here, I've intentionally included uh, the absolute defaults uh, for the question editor. No initialization options at all. And the point being, you are going to see the question editor in its default state, but within the author API. And this is where we're going to be modifying these values when we start to change them. So as you can see, it's inside the config property. Uh, inside the author API config, there are two basic or two main dependencies. The first is the question editor, which is what we'll be modifying. And you can also make some changes to the version of the questions API you're using if you want to work with a particular version, a legacy version, or upgrade to a new version, and so on. Uh, the author API does do version mapping, so we'll take care of that for you, but it gives you the, the ability to control these elements when you're working with the author API. So if you take a look now, uh, you'll see back in Chrome the, the basic implementation within the author API. I have intentionally started with the list view to give you a more familiar view if you're looking at this in the author site. This is the list of all the items available within your item bank. And then as we either work with an existing item or more often, in our case, creating a new item, uh, you'll see that as soon as you add a question to that item, you now are looking at the same uh, question editor view that you saw in the standalone version. So we have our question templates, the same question groups. Here again, this is the default view, so you have the exact same view you saw before, uh, including the restored change button and the restored source button. So now let's take a look at how we can make those same modifications within the author API. So let's switch back over to our change here within the author API. And we're simply going to add the init options that you saw in the standalone version. We're going to switch over to our edit preview split pane view. We're going to hide, hide the change button and we're going to hide the source button. The only difference here is that because you're now authenticating the author API in a full process, the key, the consumer key that is ordinarily used in the standalone question editor authentication is no longer needed. It's redundant. So you don't need that anymore. All you have to do is pop in, in this case, our UI changes. And then when we switch back to see this in view, you'll see that not only are we looking at this in the author API, but having made those two modifications, when we look at adding a question, you'll see now there's no change button and no source button. So nothing new on the feature front, but the point being you're able to customize the question editor the same way, whether it's standalone or within the author API. While on that subject, in fact, 
for those of you who are using the author portal, the author site that's hosted by Lernocity, you can use these source files that you can download from this webinar and make all of the modifications you want, create all of the custom templates you want, test them uh, to make sure you're satisfied with them, and then you can send that JSON to the support team uh, at Lernocity and we will implement those changes for you in the author site. So I'm off the top of my head, I'm unaware of anything that I'm going to show to you today that we cannot also do for you in the author site. You simply need to be responsible for creating the JSON to make sure it suits your needs and that you're happy with it, and then we'll implement it for you. Okay, so let's now move on to taking a look at how we can uh, customize our uh, interface to a, a greater degree. The first thing we're going to look at, pardon me, is the uh, opinionated version of this that Lenocity has introduced, the simple authoring mode. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, very, very quickly with one single property, you can dumb down the interface to restrict access to some of the more advanced features. And a good example of where you might want to put this into play is when you're exposing your authoring environment to the end user. So for example, if you have teachers in the field who are authoring content and you don't want them to be able to change the source or change the question, the two examples we looked at before, or if you want to reduce some of the more advanced features that are available on a per question basis, you can do that. So let's go ahead and look at a demo of simple authoring. Uh, just to remind you, there are online hosted demos as well as the content that you may wish to download from this particular webinar, so you can take a look at both. So let's go over to the source again. Again, this is sort of a hands-on webinar, which is why we're, we're switching back and forth, less of a slide deck type of thing. And let's take a look at how to enable simple authoring. You'll see that I've added only one property here. So under the init options for the question editor, which is where we will always be working in these files, uh, in the same UI and, and layout property that we looked at before to change to our split uh, pane preview, edit preview mode, we're now adding the layout mode is simple. The default mode is advanced, which is the out of the box uh, view that we looked at before. And now we're going to look at some of these elements in the questions that we saw before, like the advanced options hidden from view. So let's go back over to Chrome again, and let's take a look at this in action. And we're again gonna be visiting the author API. That's gonna be our default view. We're gonna create a new item. We're presented with the simpler version of the templates. Uh, the groups are principally the same, but we have fewer options. In this case, we have just multiple choice, true, false, and choice matrix. We don't have, for example, the block view or multiple choice matrix options and so on and so forth. We don't have a standalone template for multiple responses. But the idea, again, is to simplify this to make it a little bit less intimidating to the end user rather than the power users that currently work for your existing authoring team. So this is uh, simplified, and then once we look at what we've been using as our barometer, you'll see that all of the uh, editing choices for multiple choice have been reduced to the stem, the distractors, and the correct answer. Uh, there are still the abilities, the, the two features here to manipulate how they're displayed, whether you wanna add uh, multiple responses converting to a checkbox format, or whether you wanna shuffle the options uh, at display. That only changes the, the display of the question, not the underlying question data, but it allows you to shuffle that content. That's available, but the entire more options section, for example, is completely gone. Also, again, uh, we have chosen to continue to, change, to hide the change question button, and we've continued to hide the uh, source button so you can uh, exert an element of control over the UI, even in simple authoring mode. Now the question then becomes, are you satisfied with the opinionated view that Lenocity has taken with simple authoring? Or for example, do you want to show some of the more options, but not all of them? Do you want to restrict access even further? And that's where we begin to look at a greater degree of customization beyond just the simple authoring mode. So let's take a look at custom templates and groups. So here again, uh, the idea is to look at how you can present a specific view for your authors. In other words, your version of the opinionated view. You'll be able to hide and show individual features. 
You'll be able to change the default values that are presented when the question is viewed. So you could, for example, put in placeholders or existing values. I'll show you an example, for instance, of populating a score. You can change a stimulus. Uh, all of those will become obvious when we begin to look at them. Once you create those templates, you can then organize them into groups. And you'll see those groups appear in the left menu that we looked at, which we'll see in just a moment. And then later on, we'll see that we can cascade that customization down into not only any custom templates that you might create, but also existing questions, either at the question type level or at a very specific uh, question within that. So you could affect all questions or only multiple choice questions or only a specific template. So let's take a look at this in action. When we move back to our demo, let's take a look at the source code first just to give you an idea of what we're looking at here. So there are two basic parts of creating custom templates. The first is the template itself, and we'll take a look at this. You've probably seen JSON for multiple choice before, but as you can see here, it's pretty straightforward. You see the options available to you. These are the distractors. Any kind of formatting options you may have enabled. In this case, it's a block uh, view. You've got your stimulus, the question type itself, and then the validation. Uh, but in addition to that, we now have the name of our desired template, and then here is an entree into part two of this process, which is where you want this template to appear. So just before we go on to that, again, this highlighted area here is nothing more than the question data uh, that you've seen before. So that becomes the default value for this question when this template is created, and that gives you the ability to customize this, this heavily. So as you can see here, we'll have a unique stimulus. And uh, up here, we have this set into the custom group called Project Form. Before we look at those custom groups, I'll just scroll through the other three as a sort of a big picture view. We have a short text version in Project Sum. We have a drag and drop in Project Sum. And then we have a fill in the blank text also in Project Sum. So again, these are just uh, question data. You have the ability to override this features and hide individual elements. We'll take a look at that periodically through the seminar. Uh, you'll see that in this case, we've hidden the is math option, uh, the instructor review of the stimulus, uh, individual response containers. So you can customize this at the template level. Later on, we'll look at customizing it at the question level or even all questions. So now that we have a general idea that we have four custom templates. You'll obviously see that in just a moment in the UI. Let's take a look at this last step, which is how you want to organize them. So in addition to the custom question templates that I've created, I'm also creating two new custom groups, Project Summative and Project Formative. And this reference, Project Form in this case, is where you assign the question to appear. So it's pretty straightforward. Again, you're grabbing the JSON for the default straight from the question editor. You're giving that template a name and then determining where that template is to be assigned. And you can do that for any question type, which is why I quickly gave you that big picture view of multiple question types. Uh, and then, of course, each question type can have multiple templates. Uh, this array format allows you to put in multiple templates for any question type you want to customize. So let's take a look at that now. So we should see four new templates, and we should see them organized into two custom groups. So here again, we start with the author API. We'll go to add a question to the item. And now right away, we see two new groups here, project formative and project summative. In the project formative group, we have one new custom question template. You'll see when we look at this that there is a different stimulus. We've restricted to three distractors instead of four. All of this accomplished through this custom question template, J or sorry, custom template JSON. Uh, and when we go back to the editor, you'll, or the uh, tile view, you'll see in the second group, we have our other three new templates. In this particular case, it's short text. Uh, this is uh, fill in the blank closed association. Uh, and this is the closed text, fill in the blank text. Uh, and in each case, you can customize these values to suit your needs, as I showed you in the JSON. So the other thing that we can look at is this group of Lernosity defaults can also be hidden. So let's say you want to restrict your authors to these particular projects, the formative 
project in the fall and the summative project that's going to be debuting in the spring or however way you want to uh, set up your analogy. So you can also hide all of these options by choosing to set the templates uh, groups to false. So you don't want to show any of the uh, groups in this particular uh, Learnocity setup. So we'll take a look at that in the in an upcoming example so that you can see that closed. We can also take a look at showing you here where that might be template defaults are set to true by default here. And we want to set this to false. So let's change that now. We'll go back over to Chrome and take a look at this again. And this time when we add our questions, you'll see that you're restricted to the two projects that you want to show your end user, your teacher author or your freelance author. So it gives you an element of customization and control that prevents that sort of meddling or additional in-depth look at your, your question creation. Okay, so let's take a look now at how we can expand that. Uh, instead of restricting ourselves to individual templates and groups, uh, again, reminding you that if you're author site users, we can implement these changes for you. But in addition to that, let's take a look at how you might change the individual uh, views of each question, uh, or actually, sorry, the custom question metadata is, is organization-wide. It'll affect all of your questions, but you can add custom metadata that you can then parse at runtime. So previously, we saw that there was uh, at the, actually, let's go back to the uh, default view. We'll see the bottom of the more options has, or the question ends with the more options section. And that's true for every question, and it's unique to each question type in some cases. But these extras down here are pretty consistent. Things like acknowledgments, uh, reference to a rubric you may want to use for manual grading, a sample answer, that kind of thing, distractor rationale. But below that, there's no custom implementation, no custom data added. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add two custom metadata fields that will appear in questions during the editing process, the authoring process, so that you can parse that data at runtime. Let's take a look at another example. Now we should see custom metadata down here at the bottom. Here we go. So this looks a little bit different, which I'll explain in just a moment. But as you can see down here, you can see custom metadata. This has been added to all question types. So we can go back and see this again one more time and take a look at what's included. Let's look at a totally different question type. And then down here at the bottom, you'll see the comments field and the LMS ID. So again, you can add any kind of metadata that you wish here. It can be for behind the scenes information. It can be strictly for program, programmatic use if you wish. Our question level events and public methods will allow you to pull this data out, react to it uh, programmatically if you wish. Uh, you can store any kind of uh, reasonable size data you wish in there. Okay, so let's move on then to our next big category, which is a greater degree of customization, not only for custom templates, which you saw, but also question-wide, uh, organization-wide, uh, or specific question types, and again, back to the individual template level, if you wish. So we're going to take a look at a few ways to handle that. We're going to look at the ability to hide and show specific options. We're going to look at the ability to add or remove individual section headers. So you could, for example, move content out of the siloed section into another section. Uh, you can, again, set default values uh, for every question type, for example, if you wish. You can even edit uh, most menu options to remove individual values from a menu. If you want to, say, restrict font use, which is the demo we're going to show you, you can remove the largest or the smallest size, for example. You can even change the template thumbnails in the question editor uh, template, uh, question type view, the tile view. Uh, and then we can also take a look at how these settings will cascade, as I mentioned before, from every question to a specific question type to an individual template. So let's take a look at the code change. Again, just high level view. 
We've already covered the control of the Lernosity defaults and creating custom templates and assigning them to groups. So we'll simply drop down to the next level, which is to change the base question type. This is the first degree of cascading through question changes that we'll look at. And what we've done here is shown you four example ways that you might, or five example ways that you might change an individual question. So the first is you can hide elements. So I'm going to show you multiple choice again because that's been our barometer. And you'll see by virtue of hiding, uh, using the hidden property, we're going to hide the multiple responses checkbox and we're going to hide the shuffle options checkbox. You can also hide individual sections. So if you wish, back to our simple authoring example, if you don't want to work with our out-of-the-box implementation, you can hide the sections of your choice. But what's really nice is that you can also hide the, the organizational notion of a section by hiding the header and divider, but preserve the content and put that in another location. In this case, we're just going to show you uh, hiding the section header and the section divider so that it will appear in place. In a moment, we'll be looking at uh, in-depth panel layout uh, changes that will allow you to customize to the nth degree. So in this case, we're going to hide the idea of the more options collapsible menu and simply show that content from that section at the top level. This might prevent an end user from skipping a, set, uh, a setting that you want to make sure they uh, validate or, or populate before because they missed it in a collapsible menu. We're also going to change the defaults, and I want to show you specifically what I'm doing here because it'll demonstrate our cascading. So here at the base question type, this affects all questions. So I'm putting in a placeholder enter stimulus in the form of a question. And I'm also pre-populating the, so the default main answer will be worth one point, and the default validation score for alternate responses will be half a point. Uh, let me just skip this for a moment to make that point clear. Coming down here to demonstrate the cascading, looking at only multiple choice questions, I'm going to override that, and I'm going to make all alternate responses worth one and a half points. So you'll see that in the UI in just a moment. And then finally, as I mentioned, I'm going to remove one font option, so the huge setting will be gone. And I'm also going to change the, the tile thumbnail uh, to represent the block format because that's our, our template. So you'll see, instead of the standard radio buttons, you'll see the block style of, of the graphics. So this just gives you some representative things that you can change using this approach. Again, base question affects all questions. So we're hiding and, and changing the defaults. We'll focus in on the score as an example for the alternate response. We'll show you that we can change contents of an individual menu. And then we'll show you that you can override for a per question type rather than all questions. So let's review those in the UI. Let's take a look at how we'll see our per question editors. We're first going to take a look at a uh, fill in the blank question, for example. And when we look at fill in the blank, uh, and we're going to add an alternate response here, you'll see now that for scoring, actually this isn't the best example. Let's look at multiple. Uh, let's look at uh, another question type here first. Let's take a look at choice matrix. Um, actually, this is a multiple choice question type. Let's look at let's look at a matching classification. So when we see an alternate response here, we're going to see by default, and because we applied this at the group question or all question level, our alternate response is automatically populated to be 0.5 instead of 1. Uh, now we'll go back in at the per question type, in, in this case multiple choice specifically, and we'll see that we've overridden that, and we'll see a value of 1.5. So again, you can make changes at the every question level, at the per question level, or as we demonstrated a little bit earlier, down at the individual template level. So let's go back to our code just one more time to remind us of what we've done. Here in multiple choice, we've hidden multiple responses and shuffle options. 
So here you'll see there's no multiple responses checkbox and there's no shuffle options checkbox. We've also uh, hidden the more options section but exposed the content at the top level. And we've changed our stimulus. And again, we can show that being overridden at the template level. So here is the stimulus with the placeholder. And you'll see here that the more options section, the collapsible triangle is missing, but all of the content is still visible here at the top level. So let's go through and see one more example that we haven't seen so far, which is overriding not only all questions, but also question type by looking at the individual setting at the template level. So this uh, custom value for only multiple choice questions is visible here. But when we go back to look at the template we created earlier, you'll see that it has yet a different stimulus, which we added at the template level. So again, it's just like cascading style sheets, you'll get your property overrides from all questions to question type to individual template. Okay, let's move on to the last section, which is a much greater or deeper level of customization, and that's using custom layouts. Now, we're going to look at this very quickly in the interest of time and um, typical usage, uh, but if you have any specific questions, we can revisit this as we go. So, at the global layout uh, level, what we're talking about here is changing the editor as a whole. So one simple example of this would be looking at the question editor in a modal or a portion of the question editor in a modal. Or you might use some of the existing UI elements that are incorporated into the editor, such as tabs or accordions and things of that nature, to change how the editor as a whole is presented in your own UI. So let's take a quick demo look at this. This is one of the hosted demos that we'll take a look at. And you'll see in this particular case, you've got custom tabs created. Uh, you still have the tile view that's the same, but when we begin to edit a new question, you've now popped this editor portion into a modal, if you will. Uh, you've got your preview pane and your source pane. You can still scroll within this. Uh, you can expose additional elements like the more options section that we had hidden previously. Uh, and so the ability to set up a global layout uh, again, affects the editor as a whole. But let's take a look at a more intimate view of this and look at how we might put into effect a layout on a per question basis. So in this case, we're looking at panel edits. And when you create a panel edit, you're creating, for example, an editor for multiple, cho pardon me, multiple choice or for fill in the blank. And we'll take a look at how that works by comparing the default view, which is simply, uh, here let's take a look at uh, standard multiple choice. Uh, you'll see the distractor, I mean the stimulus and distractors, the correct answer. This has more options uh, suppressed. So let's take a look at the default view and you'll see that you have the collapsible arrows that we just talked about under more options. Oops, excuse me. Um, so there you can see a section being pulled into view. And what we're going to do is we're going to change this so that it appears inside an accordion. So let's take a look at the JSON first. So again, we're not going to review what we've already done. Quickly, we've modified our template defaults, individual custom groups and templates. We have changes at the base question uh, for all, affecting all questions. We've got ch changes available to a specific type of question. But what we're going to do now is up here at the UI property, we're going to invoke a custom layout for all multiple choice questions. So we're effectively creating a unique editor specific to the multiple choice question type. And this reference is the name of the script that you create when building this editor in XML format. So if we come down here into the body of the DOM, you'll see here there is a new script tag added here. And if you look, you'll be familiar with this name I just showed you a moment ago, custom MCQ layout. And then this is the XML or the HTML uh, of the custom uh, edit panel that you've created. And in this particular case, we're using the accordion. 
And so within this particular accordion, we have a panel that is for the basic options for the stimulus and distractor. We have another panel, and this contains the validation information. And then we have a third panel, uh, which contains the more options, if you will. So now we've converted this editor to all at the top level with that more options expansion area to collapsible accordion panes that you could focus on only one element of editing, uh, not being distracted by any other elements of the editor perhaps. Let's take a look at this in action. We'll go back to our basic menu of, of choices here and we'll look at our custom editor. So let's refresh uh, the fact in your minds that this only applies to multiple choice. We'll take a look at fill in the blanks and we'll see the standard layout here. No changes have been made here. In this particular case, we've suppressed more options at the base question type, but it's still in our out-of-the-box format. And if we go back now to look at multiple choice, suddenly we see that element being, that UI being presented in an accordion view. So we have our basic options with STEM distractors. We have the validate, validation pane, and we have the other options pane. So again, this is a simple example, simply moving the elements that are prescribed in the documentation. Each of these UI elements has a label and an input, uh, and you can place them in individual locations. Uh, one other example that's been discussed in the past, that I don't have a, a demo to show you, but as a simple example for multiple choice, you might put the distractor rationale immediately below the distractor itself, uh, so that the author can go ahead and put the, the rationale for using that distractor immediately after authoring the, the distractor itself. So you can customize this to the nth degree to whatever uh, ability our, our custom layout supports. Again, this is individual manipulation at the DOM level, so it's not as simple as hiding or showing in JSON properties, but it's not overly onerous either. Uh, it's just a matter of going through the documentation and seeing what's possible and what's not. So that's uh, the high level view that we were looking at. Um, I want to open the floor to questions. Uh, I also want to point out that the source code is available here at this link. Uh, I'll mention here in the recording, should this link change, uh, that um, you, know, you can contact support for information about the source code, but it's up there now and should be able to, to reside at this location for some time. So uh, I'm gonna now expose the UI for the webinar and look into the questions pane. Hopefully we have some questions or you may ask them. Uh, apologies for having trouble hearing. Again, uh, I got a notification that the session was broken up. Uh, so let's take a look at this first question. Is it possible to create a template that by default has two questions? For example, I want to create a template for an EBSR so that when I click to add an EBSR, by default there are two multiple choice questions for me to fill out uh, and are both set to dependent scoring. That's a great question. What you're talking about there is item level templates. So what we're discussing in this uh, webinar is the question level editing via the question editor. You're talking about customizing the author API and customizing item level templates. At present, we don't have item level templates. Let me give you a quick uh, example of what was, was asked. Here at the item level, you can go in, for example, to layout. You could set up two columns. Uh, you could you know, set the percentage use of those columns and so on, whether you add tabs and so on. And then you might add a, an EBSR question over here on the left, just quickly, and then another one over here at the right. And the, the question is, can we set up this uh, template here at the item level? At present, item level templates don't exist, uh, but it is something that we've been discussing. Uh, this is something that you will want to log as a feature request with your uh, support representative. Okay, additionally, is it possible to create templates that by default include a passage? So that's uh, just abbreviating here, same thing uh, for the EBSR, prompt to either add a new passage or select an existing passage. So here again, uh, you're also talking about item level templating, and what we're discussing here is the editing of the individual question inside the item. Uh, but the, the question here w was, can we set up a template that might start off with a passage uh, on the left and a question on the right, hypothetically? I didn't add any text there, but you get the idea. 
And again, that's item level templating, which is not something we offer. It has come up before, but it has never really reached critical mass. If you log this as a feature request, uh, it's something that we may be able to address in the future. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Do you have to use a custom layout to extend or override the styles only of the provided templates? Uh, I know this is um, mute or listen only mode, uh, so I can't ask a question, but I'm assuming you mean uh, CSS, uh, cascading style sheets. Uh, you can style as much as you wish uh, using any existing styles for CSS. Uh, and in fact, there are even uh, many predefined styles that you can use to uh, customize the layout uh, in the documentation. You'll see a section CSS that will do things like add borders around sections and things of that nature. But overriding using your own CSS files uh, is something you can easily do. Uh, I should point out that we're talking now about the embedded uh, solutions. That's not something that you'll be able to easily do in the author site. There's a some degree of uh, styling capabilities there. For example, you can manipulate the custom styles menu in the WYSI HTML rich text editor to add styles to question data that way. Uh, but when you're talking about embedding your authoring solution into your own single sign-on environment, you can style that to your heart's content. If that's not about uh, CSS, please clarify. I think it's Jennifer, or Jonathan rather. Um, please uh, clarify the question here and I'll try to get to it. Uh, yes, you will log item templates as a feature request. Absolutely, Jackie. Uh, and I've reached the end of the questions that have already appeared in my UI. So please uh, pipe up if you have any other remaining questions. Um, Sirsha, do you want to do a wrap up if we await additional questions? Thanks, Rich. Um, that's all from me anyway, so I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us again today and hopefully you did definitely find it beneficial. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, the recording will be sent out to you probably tomorrow um, and any other follow-up questions that you may have in the meantime, do feel free to get in touch with us at marketing at .com or contact your designated uh, support contact. And thanks again for joining. I don't so, uh, think we have any, oh, there's just a thank you message, but I don't think we have any further questions, Rich. Agreed. I was just going to say the same thing. Uh, thank you also, Priscilla, and thanks everyone for attending. Please contact any of your support reps if you have particular questions about this topic or others. And as we mentioned earlier with Jackie, uh, log any feature requests that may have come up from this particular demo. Thanks very much, and I uh, hope to see you again in a feature of the month in the future.